Tonight I want to, um, it, I know it's been a month or so, but uh, the last time I ministered on the diligent Christian, and I just titled this the same thing because it's just basically going to be a continuation of that. The diligent Christian, you and I as believers, as Christians need to be diligent and not slothful or lazy, but diligent. So this is what we're going to talk about. I want to start in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read a few of these scriptures just to get, just to get started, just to get going here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hallelujah. Before we read, let's just go ahead and ask uh, the Lord for his help tonight. Father, we come to you again in the name of Jesus, thanking you and praising you, God, for your word. Lord, I ask that you help us tonight by your word. Help us by the anointing of God. Teach us, show us your ways. May we walk in new light. New understanding, new truths, Father. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, God, ahead of time for your help. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. You know, do you know that um, utterance from the preacher or words that the preacher preaches to you and to me is greatly affected by how you hear it? So I need you to hear really well tonight. Because I need all the help I can get. I always say that, but it's true. You need all the help you can get. And thank God for the helper. So let's hear this word tonight together. Because uh, this word, as, as well as uh, you know, most others that I've taught, is mainly for me. But I understand that if it's for me, it can also be for you. And to help you. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, we'll start in verse eight. It says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Do you remember when you were in darkness? Do you remember the day when you, uh, uh, when the light came on and brought you out of that darkness? You've been translated out of that into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his dear son. And we used to be that way. I talked to someone the other day and I said, something you need to understand is that old man is dead. He should no longer have dominance over you. He should no longer have authority and, and, and it's keeping the flesh under, controlling things that you're thinking about. That old man's dead in his old ways. So put those things aside. He says, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Then it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Now go down to verse 15. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Another translation says it like this, and it'll help us understand it. Make the most of every opportunity. You and I as Christians have to make the most of every opportunity that we have, every moment that we have in our Christian walk. In the life that we live, we've got to make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. There was a time, most of us in here, I'm sure you can think back. There was a time that um, you know, things are okay today that didn't used to be okay. Uh, things are more acceptable today than they were 20 years ago, 10 years, how about five years ago? You see, because uh, tolerance will bring conformity. The more you tolerate something, the more you tolerate it, you tolerate it, you tolerate it. Over time, you'll just get used to it, and then it'll just be okay. I give the example all the time of our, of our dog when he was little, younger. I used to holler at him and get on him for jumping on the couch. And here we are 10 years later, 
And I'm saying, come on, get up on the couch, buddy. Come on, get up there. You know, got to help you up sometimes. Christy knows how he is. He's real slow motion, man, climbing up there. You see, I didn't used to tolerate that. But now I'm encouraging him. Yeah, and he has his own couch now that he lays on. Leather at that. And, and, and every, you know, every evening, every night, you know, I'll go down and sit in my chair and he'll come down there and climb up on his couch. I didn't used to tolerate that. There are things that you and I never used to tolerate, but now they just happen. I went and looked at a job Monday at a, uh, is that a Catholic church? Big, great big Catholic church, south, south side of Dayton. I'd never been over there before. And um, the church has a school next to it. And they're going to tear down the school. So uh, the, I don't know, the maintenance man or whatever there that, that was in there, he said that um, he graduated from that school in 1972. And in 1972, there was around 1,000 students that went to that Catholic school. And he said just about all the students, he don't know of any, about all those 1,000 students were members in the church or their families were. This past year, 2020, 2024 school year, they had their last graduating class. He said there was 136 kids left in the school, not graduated, left in the school, 136 kids, and three of them are members of the church. So, uh, you know, maintenance costs and different things, costs of stuff, um, they've just decided to close it up and tear it down. So that's what they're doing. You know, what has happened over the years? Most of you can think about and remember when church was priority in people's lives. Just a few minutes ago, I was talking to Joseph. You know, he rides his motorcycle to church. And I said, Joseph, I hope you stay dry on the way home, you know. But, you know, we talked about, yeah, we, he watched the weather. He's looking at it, this and that. And he said, but that was really the only way he could get to church tonight was on his motorcycle. And he says, thank God I can come to church tonight. What enthusiasm to come to church. How many people didn't come tonight because it's raining or it's too hot or the music's too loud? Paula sings too long. It's too cold in here. This is some of the stuff we're going to get into. But let's make the most of every opportunity. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. This will kind of remind you. Uh, this is where I started last time, and, and we'll just kick off and go from there. But in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, Hebrews 6 and 10, for God is not unjust. To forget your work and labor. There we have the words work and labor together. When sometimes there's people that when they hear work, it's bad enough. But when you put labor with it, work and labor, what kind of image do you get in your mind? You may think about the work that you do. Or you think of labor, you're thinking of people toiling, you're working and toiling. But I want you to notice what he says here. God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love. Do you know that work is God's idea? Work is God's idea. And he's looking at us as Christians, as believers. He knows what we're doing. What, what, how are we working and laboring in this life that we're in? This life. And, I, and it, doesn't, it doesn't always mean uh, your work that you do on your job. It's your work and your labor throughout this life. What have you done to help people? What have you done that affected people's lives? See, th these are things that we'll be judged on, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, what, are we, what have we done? Because, you know, the older I get, I'm 56 now. I'm, you know, that's just unreal to me. 56. Um, 
30s and 40s, I don't know whatever happened to them. I skipped them. I skipped, I went from my, I went from 29 to 50, it seems like. But you understand what I mean? It seems like time flies the further along you get. And what the Lord's been dealing with me about is you're already 56, or I can see that I'm already there. Begin to look at what have you done to affect people's lives. I don't want to get to heaven and, and, th and see that I could have done so much more. I don't want to get there and say, I missed it here, I missed it there. How many opportunities come our way that we don't notice and we don't see them because we're not really have, we don't really have an ear to the Spirit all the time? We might have missed something. I don't want to miss anything. I want to make the most of every opportunity that I have left. You see? Our life on this earth is like a vapor, the Bible says. It's here for a little while and it's gone. You can live to be 100, 110. That's still baby. That's infant in God timing, isn't it? That's still, it, but it's, it's, it's like a vapor. You're here and you're gone. And what I want to encourage each and every one of us in here tonight, it doesn't matter how old you are. You've got to make the best of every opportunity on what are you doing to affect people's lives? What are you doing? Because that's a work and labor of love. Because all through this life, it's a faith fight. Fight the good fight of faith. You know, we've got to, you have to work out your own salvation. And on top of all this, you, you've got to be, you, you want to be a good witness. You want to continue to grow in Christ. You want to grow up in him. These are things that we do and that we shouldn't get slack at it. But we've got to remain fervent. Because look at what he says here. Um, let me just start over again. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Until when? The end. You show the same diligence. That, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Do not become sluggish, but imitate those. Imitate who? Does the Bible not have uh, a lot of great faith people in it? Do you know faith people personally? Imitate these people. Imitate those in the word. Look at Jesus. He's our example. Uh, can you think of someone in your life that was a great um, um, influence, a godly influence? Absolutely. We, you know, most of us can. Most of us can. If you can't, you're like, I'm a first generation Christian in my family and people I know. Well, guess what? You be the influencer. Yeah. It's got to start somewhere. And you know what? It is true. Every one of us are influencers. We should be influencing someone somehow. But this word diligence, this is what it means. It means speedily, promptly, early. Uh, another translation says at dawn. And that's what that means, early, at dawn, like early in the morning. Um, fervent, eager, and determined. This is diligence. We have to be eager and be determined. Um, Look over now in Romans 12. Just to catch you up, just to catch us all up. Romans, Romans chapter 12 and verse um, 11. Let's look at verse 9. Uh, Romans 12 and 9. In fact, the heading on my Bible says this above verse nine, the Christian and those within God's family. So this is, this is what we should be. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. You know, if you, the, this is something that, that you and I are actually supposed to hate something. We are actually supposed to hate evil. 
Why? Because God does. You hate it. You, you abhor it. Uh, you, don't, you don't tolerate it. Don't tolerate that. You, 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 because the more you tolerate it, the more you're going to conform, and, the, and eventually it'll, be, it'll start to be okay. You know why things are so bad today in the day that we're in? It's not because there's more demons in the planet or that Satan's gaining more, more strength and power. It's because people, over, over time, over eons of time, and it's getting, it's getting even more, um, I guess, concentrated, is that more and more people are becoming more permissible, more permissive to evil, and opening the door to it, giving them ease of access to have influence on people. You see it all the time. You can't, I, I look, I, I, I have a, I, my, my dad was like this. We would watch people. He would watch people. And what I mean by that, you go to a restaurant, go to a ball game, go to, go to the store. The store's the worst. Any department store, almost. People are so depressed. And the other day, Janine, there was a, Janine was telling me there was a lady um, in a store department store and her and her it looked like a teenage daughter were fussing with one another but cussing like sailors at each other words the girl should have never heard yet (laughs) you know what I mean but she probably learned them from mom what's wrong with this picture How, how how in the store so everybody can hear them See, there was a time not long ago, <laughs> you wouldn't see that. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean people weren't doing that. They probably just didn't do it in public. Now it's just all over. You know, it's just one of them things. So why do these things happen? Why is it happening? It's because people are being more permissible, just like the man I told you about uh, at the Catholic Church. You know, oh, where, what happened? How come there's not a thousand kids there now? What happened? How's come churches aren't full now like they they used to be? How's come people don't honor God the way they used to? You know, what's happening? Uh, This is why. It's because we're in the last of the last days. And you and I, as Christians, not just here in this church, but churches all over, people that love the Lord, people that have a heart to grow in Him, people who who read the Word and they pray, uh, we have become the salt of the earth. Don't let that salt lose its saltiness. You've got to stay fervent. You've got to stay diligent. Um, Where did I stop or did I even start? uh, Romans 12, 9 again. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence. Now, I know your King James will say not slothful in business, but that's what it means. Not lagging, not, don't be slothful. Uh, that word business is translated diligence. It's the same word that you'll see throughout uh, much of the New Testament. It's diligent. Don't lag in that. But be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given in hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Ooh, you know, all this stuff stuff sounds great. We're going to continue in prayer. We're going to help people. We're going to distribute to the needs of people. Um, We're going to. We're going to show hospitality to people. You know, you're just going to be nice to people. But bless those who persecute you. Oh, my goodness. How do you do that? Bless those who persecute you. You know, most of the time, if someone's trying to, if, you know, I, persecution and, and being picked on are, are two different things, obviously. But I think for what most people in America are used to are getting, getting um, slapped down with words or, you know, people just mouthing them or, or whatever's happening or maybe just trying to make, um, um, you know, 
giving you a hard time or something like that. That's not just per, that's not persecution. But if this is a person who is um, doing these things to you, you still need to pray for that person. Don't pray about the circumstance. Pray to pray for that person. Because guess what? The Lord died for that person as well as he did for you. That person's just important to God than you are to God. You understand? He loves us. He wants everyone. He's, he's not, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants all to come to, you see, the knowledge of Christ. So bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not uh, set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. Um, another translation of verse 11 says this. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Sometimes, you know, you need to work on that. Who can serve the Lord enthusiastically? Yeah, you need to work on that. We all need to work on that. Amen. You believe it? Remember, I told you that this was more for me than it was for you. Because I'm gonna, we're going to look at the flip side of diligence. You say, okay, I understand diligence. I understand it. Uh, you got to be on fire for God. You're working hard. You're, you're staying focused. You're fervent. You're determined. You're determined to be, to, to, to be this child of God that's going to make a difference in someone's life and make a difference in my church and make a difference in the ministry. Okay, let's look at the flip side of this. Let's look at the lazy person. Let's talk tonight about the lazy person. And this is where I stopped the last time. This was the question I asked when I closed out a month ago. Are you tired all the time? Some of you are hot all the time. You're back there. On. <laughs> but are you tired all the time? Remember, this is for me. There's a lot of times I'm like, man, how many of you ever say, man, I'm really tired today. I don't feel like doing nothing today. I just feel lazy today. Anybody ever say that? Besides me? I'm having a lazy day. Man, I'm tired. Man, we've been so busy. I'm just exhausted. What happens if you say that every day? Every day for years and years and years. Are we not faith people? What are you saying? What does faith say? Faith calls in those things that be not as though they were. If I'm constantly saying I'm tired, I don't feel like doing nothing, I'm lazy, I'm bummed out, um, you know, I keep gaining weight, I'm getting bigger. What if I say that every day? The Bible says the weak should say that they are what? Yeah. The weak don't say I'm tired. The weak don't say I'm beat down. The weak says, I am strong. And then the poor say, I'm rich. So here, let me, let me make this statement. Examine what you're doing. Examine what you do every day in your spare time on the weekends, your time's off. Examine what you're doing and eliminate the stuff the Lord didn't tell you to do. Now, this is what come to me. To I need to examine myself. Look at, look at what I do. Think about all the stuff that you do in a day's time, in a week's time. Examine them, look at them, and eliminate the stuff that the Lord didn't tell me to do. I'm going to read. These are things that people spend time. 
And it's just a, a, a short list. Why am I getting a phone call? I thought I turned that off. It's your brother. <laughs> <clears throat> These are things <laughs> that people spend time doing uh, over a lifetime. Let, let me give you an example. Television. On average, now these things are all on average, a person spends nine years of their lifetime watching television. Nine years. That's on average. Probably some more than others. More. Cleaning your home. Women spend 1.5 years of their lifetime cleaning their home. Men spend half that time. <laughs> Social media. This is uh, spending time updating statuses, writing posts and comments, and scrolling through feeds. Seven and a half years. Now, when I got this information, I thought, uh, that's got to be more than that. And so when I looked at when that was written, that article was written, that article is almost 10 years old now. So I would say that you could almost double that. But you got to understand, this was just updating, writing posts and comments and scrolling. Well, that's what most people are doing anyway, scrolling, looking through. Here's an example, just TikTok. Three years of your life spent on TikTok. Any TikTokers in here? Nobody. There's not one TikToker. Okay, 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 yeah. Who wants to know Jesus tonight? Let me see a raise of hands. There we go. <laughs> How many TikTokers? But you, three years of your lifetime. Now, a lot of these things were based upon, um, especially with the social media stuff, it was based on a person uh, living to uh, the average age of like 78 years old, but beginning at five years old, like watching television starting at five. Um, kids are on social media or even just screen time uh, before five. So I know that firsthand. Mobile gaming apps. Mobile gaming apps, 12 years. 12 years. These are just averages. You'll like this one though, 33 years in bed. 26 years sleeping and seven years trying to sleep. That's a lot. Then you spend 4.5 years eating. It doesn't seem like much when you're taking a teaspoon of it every day, when you're doing just a little bit of it every day. But over a lifetime, you, you kind of wonder when you get to heaven, are they going to say, my goodness, you spent 12 years watching TV or playing games. I told you in my word to make the most of every opportunity, not to play solitaire or whatever. That's probably the old-fashioned game now. I don't know. You're laughing. You know what? I mean. Okay, you played it on the way to church. Well, at least you're not playing it during church. That's why you keep her in the front row so that she stays off her phone. So, <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to get to heaven saying I wasted time on something like that. Someone's life could have been changed or saved, but I, there I was uh, playing on my phone. Or there I was watching TV. Now we understand most some of this stuff you have to do. Of course, sleeping and eating. Some pe there are some people you have to do social media, maybe for your business and stuff, advertising, different things like, I mean, there's so much um, uh, screen time. I did, have, did find one on the screen time, but I didn't put it on there because I don't think that counts because I, I probably spend four hours a day screen time just in front of a computer. And most of you more than that probably. So, um, uh, but even then, 
Uh, I'm all the time getting on our grandkids. You're getting way too much screen time. Don't let them, don't let them do that. You know, you give, you're giving them the phone to keep them quiet, but come on. You know what I mean, don't you? Am I the only one that has grandkids that, that know more about their phone than you know about yours? I never thought I'd see that happen in my life. I remember I used to have to help my mom and dad, you know, set the time on the VCR. Because, <laughs> you know, they would be sitting there blinking 12 o'clock. <laughs> I'm really speaking my age now. Ain't it? Oh, wow. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. Let's go to Proverbs. You want to talk about you want to talk about the lazy man, you got to go to Proverbs. There are so many scriptures in Proverbs about the lazy person. Proverbs chapter 20. And verse four, Proverbs 20 and verse four, it says the lazy man or the sluggard, the lazy man will not plow because of winter or because it's cold. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. Now we read this and you're like, okay, yeah, I see that. Now this is saying this guy is not going to go plow because it's cold. How many, uh, just like I said, there's some people probably didn't come to church tonight because it's too hot. Or it's going to rain. I'm not going to plow today. It's too cold. You know, I've, uh, you know, the cold really just gets to my bones. I'm really sensitive to cold, so I'm not going to plow today. Well, you're not going to plow tomorrow either. There'll be something wrong with tomorrow. You're going to be waiting for the perfect day to plow. Waiting for that time to come. Go over to chapter 26. This, this is very similar to this. Very similar to that. Proverbs 26 and 13. It says, <laughs> this lazy man says, nah, there's a lion out there. Nah, I'm not going out there. I'm staying right here. Why? Well, there's a lion out there. See, that's, that's how this verse is coming across. The lazy man said, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion in the streets. Well, I'm not going out today. Well, why not? There's a lion out there. You know, I saw, I saw on the news one time there was a lion the next county over. I'm not going out there. You know, this is, this is how people talk about the lazy person, making excuses waiting for the most perfect time. You know, last week, or last time I told you about the guy that, that um, I worked around and he was supposed to show up to work on a, whatever day it was and he didn't come, but the next day he showed up? Old, older fella. Older, yeah, he was in his 50s. <laughs> older guy, you know, he's an old man. We said, we thought you were supposed to start here yesterday. He says, I was supposed to start here yesterday. Or was you? He said it was St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Uh, we had another fellow one time that didn't come to work because his windshield wipers didn't work. And it wasn't raining. There was no forecast for rain. But you never know. You just never know when a shower might break out. My windshield wipers didn't work. This is the kind, I think about that kind of stuff when I read scriptures like this. I'm not doing that. There's a line out there. I'm not plowing. Why not? It's too cold out. I'm not going out there. These are excuses that people make waiting for the perfect time. And you know what? According to the Bible, that perfect time will never come. In fact, it says you're going to go hungry. You're going to miss out. If you're waiting for the perfect time to do something, it's never going to come. It's never going to happen. I remember the first time I preached on August the 3rd, Sunday, August 3rd, 2003. 
the pastor, uh, it wasn't at this church, it was at another church. And the Lord had really revealed some things to me and showed me some things. And the pastor was at our house and I sat down with him and I told him what the Lord had showed me. He's gone through the scripture and all this. And he, he's like, man, that is so good. He says, you need to tell the people this. He says, Sunday morning, this is like on a Friday. He says, Sunday morning, I want you to tell the people what you just told me. I said, no. I said, no, you tell them. I, did, I said, I just told it to you. I just shared it with you. You tell them. He says, oh, no, really. You need to do this because, it, you know, it's in your heart. The Lord revealed it to you. You need to. And you know what I immediately began to do? Remember, this is Friday. And he's wanting me to do this Sunday morning. I started saying, uh, why don't we wait till next week? Or how about the week after that? Why this Sunday? No, let's wait. He's like, no. No, you need to. You share this while it's fresh in your spirit. But you see what I wanted to do? No. It's too cold. No. There's a lion out there. No. Let's wait till next week. What, what would that have done for me? Besides make me lose sleep. Some of you young guys that preach now, you know what it's like. You're, <laughs> I would have spent a week mulling over it, and I would have probably messed it up. Diana was there, and Bob, when I preached that first, they were there. And you know what? I thought I would be there for like 10 minutes to share this, this thing. I took the whole service, and the altars were full that morning when I got done. That was my first time. And that's one of those things you... you, you you younger guys, you'll remember the first time you preached. You'll never forget that. You'll never forget that time. But anyway, um, but I was already deep in my 30s, or in my 30s, not deep. <laughs> but I wanted to put it off. Let's wait till next week. How many, how many of you have ever done that? You know something's got to be done. And I'm not just talking about church stuff. I'm just talking about things you do. Uh, cutting the grass. Who loves that besides Rick Pease? Oh, you do. Okay, you know, so you probably never put it off. But, you know, I'm one that'll put that off. I'm, even with my new John Deere, it's like, I'm ready for somebody else to do this. But, uh, you know, you, you just put things off. Well, I'm gonna, why, why aren't you going to do it today? Well, you know, it's uh, windy. The wind's always a thing. The wind. Look over in Ecclesiastes. Um, where's that at? That is... Um, <laughs> that's in your Bible. Why did I say to go there? I don't even know where it's at. Ecclesiastes um, chapter... I got it wrote down here somewhere. 11. And verse 4. <clears throat> It says, he who observes the wind, <laughs> here we are talking about the wind, will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. One translation says it this way, a farmer who waits for the right wind will never plant any seeds. If he's always looking at the clouds, he'll never bring in his crops. Another one says, farmers who wait for perfect weather, never plant. It says if they watch every cloud, they'll never harvest. You know, I'm thankful that our farmers around here, in fact, the ones that I know, are very diligent and fervent about getting out there as quickly as possible. See, when I was young, growing up on a farm, the rule of thumb was you didn't plant until after Mother's Day. Now there's stuff coming up by Mother's Day. So, you know, they get out there early as they can and, um, to get it done. And then you'll see them all summer long. They're doing stuff. They're spraying. They're doing all this. Why, why are they doing that? Because, that, well, that's their livelihood. <laughs> but they're doing that to take care of it. They want it to grow. They want it to produce. They want it to do the right thing. But, you know, the, the farmer that, that may sit back and say, ah, it's too windy, you know, 
Uh, it looks cloudy out today. It might rain. I'm not even going to go out there and start. Sometimes, most of the time, you and I just have to, just have to get it no matter what the conditions are. We just have to do it. There, there was times, um, you know, working in construction, I can think of John. I'm, me and him was on a job one time, and it was so, John Morrison, and I was an apprentice, and we were to work on this top of a tank, and it snowed and freezing rain all night, and you know, in the wintertime, it's dark at 7, 7.30 in the morning, and so I went up there, and I'm up there on top of this tank waiting for John to come up. John comes up, <laughs> up the ladder and pokes his head over the top and sees all that ice and snow up there. And he says, it's going to take a better man than me to do this. And down he went, <laughs> down he went. And so, but he was right. We had no business being up there, but uh, I mean, there was times you go out there in the ice and the snow. I remember wiping freezing rain off my safety glasses. And it's like, uh, you know, we had no business being out there, but because it had to be done and it was an emergency situation type thing, you just weathered it and went through it and got it done with, with diligently getting it done despite the conditions. And sometimes our Christian walk is that way. The conditions can be ugly, it can be cloudy, it can be stormy, it can be a mess, but you continue diligently persevering fervently through and into what God has called you to. You just continue to march through it. You continue diligently to, because guess what? There's always a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough. There's always a breakthrough. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people like to spend their time in the valley of the shadow of death, but the Bible says we're going through it. You go through it and you break through the other side. Don't give up and don't stop, but just stay strong in what the Lord would have you to do. Um, so here's a question. What are you doing when you're waiting for the perfect conditions? What are you doing? Nothing, nothing. You're remaining idle. You're tired. You're, you're not going to, you know, you're just doing nothing. Now, um, there's a verse of scripture. Let's go over it. This will probably be the, one of the last ones. We'll maybe, um, James chapter one. James chapter 1 and verse uh, 2. James 1 and 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I want you to notice these words in here, patience and perfect. This word perfect or perfection, what it means is completeness, just com completeness or fullness. Not flawless. You think of something perfect. If somebody painted, a, a, you know, if somebody paints that wall over there, you say, man, that looks, that's just perfect. I love it. Like you know, they've done it with perfection. Uh, so it's flawless. But this perfect means completeness, something that's complete or full. Patience. But let patience have its perfect work. This word patience does not mean passive, idle waiting. Kind of like I, what I do every Sunday morning when I'm sitting in my car in the garage. Waiting. <laughs> Patiently waiting. The car is on idle. So we're idling and we're waiting. Patiently. That happens frequently. Anybody, any other guys? 
So you know what I'm talking about. But this word in James for patience does not mean that. It doesn't mean patience the way you're thinking like waiting. But this word for patience means perseverance. Perseverance. This is something that many people lack is perseverance. People will give up too early. Stay in there, stay, hang in there, keep going. There's things, uh, just because you've only been praying about it and believing God for it for a week, and it hasn't come to pass yet, you're ready to just give up. Well, no, you've got to be persistent. Persevere. Stand in your faith. Find, find, find the word that, that deals with your situation and grow in it. Grow. This may take time. You realize some things may take decades for people, whatever it may be. But you consistently persevere in it. You never give up. And something that I found out, if you're believing God for something, and it's been a long time, even in, in uh, whatever may be a long time for you, and you continue, you continue to bring it up in prayer, you talk to the Lord about it, and then all of a sudden one day it's like, I might as well forget it. This isn't going to come to pass. This isn't going to happen. Let, let me help you with something. When you get that thought, it's getting ready to break through. Because if the devil can get you to stop right here, it'll never happen. If he can get you to give up, it'll never come to pass. So that, to me, is a signal that this thing's getting ready to happen. If he's working on me so hard to let go of this, if he's working on me so hard to just drop this, forget it, it's not going to happen, I might as well go to plan B or C. No, you stay on it. Because guess what? There's a God that works behind the scenes on stuff that we have no clue what's going on. And he's working behind the scenes for everybody at any given time. What's that mean, behind the scenes? You don't know what's going on. You don't know what he's lining up and getting ready to affect you, to bless you. We just finished this book in class, Expect Extraordinary. You and I have to expect blessing from heaven every day. We must do that. When you begin expecting it and, t and letting God know that you are uh, looking forward to be surprised today, surprise me today, God, bless me. I'm expecting something uh, extraordinary to happen in my life today. Not extraordinarily bad. Not extraordinarily bad. Uh, not some extraordinary defeat. No, no, no. An extraordinary blessing. Because most of the time, our thoughts are on defeat. How is this going to happen? This will never happen. I'm, never, this isn't gonna, I'm not going to make it. I'm tired. I'm, I'm lazy today. I'm tired. You see, don't expect disaster. Expect the extraordinary. Too many people expect disaster and, and expect bad things to happen. <laughs> Because that's just the way people think. That's just your thoughts. So don't, don't deviate from that. So patience means to persevere. You stay in it. You stay strong. You don't give up. Um, you stay focused. I, the Lord showed me this one time years ago of, of people that it was, it was as if there was a, a people just following Jesus. And it's, and it's like you could you'd see Jesus, you know, like holding people's hands and just as they're walking, he's just walking. And, and, but people began to fall back. It's like they became stragglers. And what the enemy loves is stragglers because they're vulnerable. A straggler can be vulnerable and they're an easy target. And what, what he was showing me there and what that meant for me was uh, there's many people that don't persevere. They don't stay in it. They don't stay strong in it. And the only way that you and I can stay strong and following God, following after his promises, uh, doing what he has called you and I to do is to stay solid in the word and in prayer and continue to do the things you know to do, like go to church uh, we know about giving. We know about reading the Bible. We know about praying. You continue to do those things. And the more you do those things, the more he can use you and direct you in, in supernatural ways. Everybody wants to hear from heaven. 
Everybody wants to be led of the Holy Ghost. And what I mean is every, every born again person, you want to be led. That's your heart. But um, are we doing the things so that he can lead us? Are we doing the things that he can give us uh, direction? Um, let me read. I've got, a, there's a few other verses here I was going to look at. In, uh, in Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter, I think I, I was already there once. We need to go back to it though. Where was it? Proverbs 26. Go back to Proverbs 26. I want to read the rest of that. Or did I tell you 26? In verse, um, it was verse 13, the lazy man that says there's a line in the road, a fierce line in the streets. It says, as a door turns on its hinges, this is verse 14, so does the lazy man on his bed. Now that paints a picture, doesn't it? You know, one, one definition for sluggard is to lean idly. And it's a picture of a person that's just leaning up against something, doing nothing. Anybody ever see? Or let me ask you this. Any of you ever do that? Just <laughs> around doing nothing. Watching the grass grow. Watching the paint dry. What are you doing today? I had nothing. Why not? I'm tired. Lazy today. It's a lazy day. Just don't feel like doing nothing. There's people like that. Maybe you're like that. I've been that way. Come on. You just don't feel like doing nothing, just tired. Now you got to be tired to go to sleep. But when you're tired at one o'clock in the afternoon, you need to change something. Some of you is like, oh, that's my nap time, one o'clock. <laughs> nap time. I don't know, it might be. Are you like this guy then? Are you like a door hinge, you know? <clears throat> squeaks. That's what that means. He's rolling over. How does a squeaky door hinge? You think of that uh, as a door turns on its hinges. So does the lazy man in his bed. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. And that is one wore out individual. He is so tired. He can't even. My brother got a new car years ago. He, he got a new car and he says, I want to show you something. And he pulls out his key fob and push the button and the, and the fuel door popped open. He says, that's for the ultimate lazy man. Push the button for the fuel door to pop open. <laughs> it's like, is that for the lazy man or is that convenient? There's some things that are convenient that will make you lazy. I ought to make a list of those. We'll do that next time. <laughs> Things that are convenient that make you lazy. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Verse 16. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. And this is this just going to bring me to this closing part right here. Lazy, sluggish people. People that are tired all the time, that are, you know, it's too cold to plow. They have brilliant minds to come up with excuses. Because no one's going to say, you know, why aren't you plowing today? I'm just too lazy. No, they're not going to say that. What are they going to say? That's too cold. They're, they'll come up with an excuse. You'll come up with an excuse. I've come up with an excuse. We all have. Why aren't you going to do this today? Well, you know, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's too this or it's too that. It's too late in the day. Too early in the morning. It's too, you know, there's always something. There's always something. There's always an excuse. But not for the diligent Christian who's on fire for the Lord. Who wants to continue to move steadfastly and strong? Amen. Well, stand up for. I know some of you are dealing with that patience right now. You are passively, idly waiting. Uh, 
Hallelujah. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me make this last statement. This will drive it home for you. If you eliminate wasted time in your life, you will change. You will change. Eliminate, <coughs> eliminate that wasted time and spending time effectively and redeeming the time, making the most of op every opportunity, it will change your life. You believe it? I believe it. So I know this was more for me than it was for you, but I hope it helped us all. I believe it did to help you. It helped me. It helped me to stay diligent, stay awake. Amen. Father, we're so blessed and thankful for the night. Lord, I thank you and praise you for this word. Lord, may we not be forgetful of it, but may we be doers of your word, not hearers only. As Father, we just praise you and thank you, God, for it. Lord, I pray for each and every one tonight that, uh, that we're kept safe and protected. Lord, we claim Psalm 91 over each and every one. Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.